Welcome to Black History in Upstate New York. This program was produced by Victoria Basulto in conjunction with the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum and funded by the Catherine W. Davis Project for Peace Fellowship awarded through Colgate University. Black History in Upstate New York will provide a combination of bite-sized informational videos and longer presentations by scholars on historical figures and places that emphasize the crucial role Black Americans have played in the history of upstate New York. The National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum honors anti-slavery abolitionists, their work to end slavery and the legacy of that struggle, and strives to complete the second and ongoing abolition, the moral conviction to end racism. The Museum and Hall of Fame's contact information is available on the screen. Hello, and once again, welcome to Black History in Upstate New York. My name is Victoria Basulto, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Kyle Bass. Kyle Bass is the author of Possessing Harriet, commissioned by the Onondaga Historical Association, which premiered at Syracuse Stage in 2018, was produced by Franklin Stage Company in 2019, and will be produced by East Lynn Theatre Company in 2022. His new play, Salt City Blues premieres at Syracuse Stage in 2022. Citizen James, or The Young Man Without a Country, about a young adult James Baldwin, commissioned by Syracuse Stage, streamed this spring and will tour live in 2022. His libretto, Liba Cotton, Here This Day, for a new opera based on the life of folk music legend Liba Cotton, was commissioned by the Society for New Music. Kyle's other full-length plays include Tender Rain, Bleecker Street, Baldwin vs. Buckley, The Fate of Our Fathers, which has been presented at Cornell University, Colgate University, the University of Delaware, and will be presented at Syracuse Stage in September 2021, and Separated, a documentary theater piece about student military veterans at Syracuse University, which was presented at Syracuse Stage and the Paley Center in New York. Kyle is also Assistant Professor of Theater at Colgate University, Associate Artistic Director at Syracuse Stage, and was the 2019 and 2020 Susan P. Strongman Visiting Playwright at the University of Delaware, a two-time recipient of the New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship, a finalist for the Princess Grace Playwriting Award, and proud member of the Dramatist Guild of America, in September, Kyle will become Syracuse Stage's first ever resident playwright. I'd like to now invite Kyle Bass to begin his presentation. Thank you, Victoria. I'm happy to be here. I was born, and I live to this very second, as we all do, in the wake of America's slavery. The purse strings of the debt in which the past holds us all is tied in a knot to slavery, this nation's original sin. But for me, it's personal. My ancestors were enslaved. I know who they were. I know their names. In my home, on the mantle, is an enlarged photograph of a century's yellow document a will dated August 5th, 1772. Written and executed in an antique cursive hand, it's too elegant for what it conveys. Ownership of human property, a Negro boy named Tim, to the wife of his master, Captain John Bennett of Westport, British Connecticut so long as she remained his widow. It's the earliest documentation of my family in this country, before it was a country. That Negro boy, Tim, was, is my five times great grandfather on my mother's matrilineal line. Tim, his wife, Lil, and their children were emancipated from slavery in New England and settled in upstate New York in the spring of 1799. My family has lived free and owned land 
in New York ever since 222 years. And from the 19th century, in my home, in the room where I write, I keep a photograph, circa 1870, of a man in a suit standing on the steps of a small wooden house set off a dirt road among trees and tall grass. The man was born into slavery in the spring of 1840 in Walkerton, Virginia. The man's name is Tolliver. I will not defile him here with his master's last name. Tolliver is my great-great-grandfather on my mother's patrilineal line. And his father, my three times great-grandfather was Alexander. His mother was called Martha. In 1849, the white American Reverend Ephraim Peabody, first among the few antebellum critics to focus on black narratives declared, quote, America has the mournful honor of adding a new department to the literature of civilization, the autobiographies of escaped slaves, those quote. Here's a piece of my great-great-grandfather's autobiography of escape. In 1863, my great-great-grandfather Tolliver escaped slavery, broke from his forced and vile servitude intended for life and meant to descend to his offspring and theirs. Tolliver was denied literacy as a condition of his captivity. Though he lived to be 80, he died in 1920. My great-great-grandfather never learned to read. He never learned to write his name. But still, the story of Tolliver's escape has come down to us through the generations. He traveled by night and hid by day as he made his way north. And one night, he stopped in the woods to rest. Somehow, he fell asleep. He awoke, the story goes, to a snake coiled against his head. Tolliver ran like hell from that serpent and he did not stop running until he reached the foothills of the Adirondack Mountains of central New York, the free state of New York. That is his slave autobiography of escape, which he told his son Herbert, who, who would tell his son my grandfather, Everett, who would tell his daughter, my mother, Juanita, who told me. Tolliver ran three days and three nights, the story goes. My feet carried me most away. God carried me the rest, we say, Tolliver said, in perhaps a touch of lore. Nonetheless, three nights, Three days, a serpent in the forest, God's helping hand in the wrenching last miles to freedom. Shall I call it mythical memory? But what's absolutely and terribly true is that my great great grandfather Tolliver had been enslaved. And what's absolutely and everlastingly true is that he made himself free. And if into his tale of brave escape, he or his children or their children wove threads from the master's sacred text, a text used by many to ordain his captivity, I stand in admiration and awe of their creative, subversive imagination. Six months after his escape from slavery, on Tuesday, August 30th, 1864, Tolliver mustered into the 26th Regiment of United States Colored Troops from New York State. There is a photograph of the 26th Regiment taken at Rikers Island. 1,200 born free, free and escaped black men presenting in formation as Union soldiers. Tolliver is somewhere somewhere among them. 
did he join the Union Army to return to the South to liberate his mother and father? Did he dream of coming upon his parents, their once enslaved son in the uniform of a Union soldier, returning to them as their liberator? Did he imagine their awe, their tears, their shouts of joy and praise? We don't know if Tolliver ever saw, heard from, or received word of his parents again. On the 178th anniversary of Tolliver's birth, I ordered a vintage 1861 map of Virginia, which shows in tables and graphs and shading that darkens from gray to black, the distribution of the Commonwealth's slave population as determined from the census of 1860. The ink spreads and darkens across the broadsheet like a bruise. 490,865 persons counted as enslaved. My ancestors, my family, my great great grandfather Tolliver, his father Alexander, his mother Martha, three of my ancestors, three we know of, three of the nearly half million captives in that stain. And in the North, Tim and Lil. I am deeply connected to and made strong by my family's history of enslavement, endurance, resistance, self-emancipation, survival, and flourishment. It is a tremendous and unceasing source of pride and fortitude in my life. What else is there to make of it that's useful? Yes, our past holds stunning, appalling pain centuries of it, but that past pain cannot be an echo chamber of my present day and future day life. I must claim the broken chains of my family's slave past and rattle them in defiant joy and celebration and yes, as a warning. And so amongst other topics, I write about slavery. Not that it's the only Black American story to write about, but because it is the genesis story of the American experience for many African Americans affecting us to this very day. My play, Possessing Harriet, is not about Black uplift or the triumph of Black self-empowerment. It's a tragedy. That Harriet must make the choice she makes to leave her family behind in slavery, likely never to see or hear from them again to be free, is a tragedy. I mean for the play to enrage and break our hearts. I began writing the play with historical figures, with the rib bones of an actual event, the facts. Harriet Powell, a mixed race fugitive enslaved woman did meet Elizabeth Cady in Peterborough, New York, at the estate of her abolitionist second cousin, Garrett Smith, in the mean autumn of 1839. And yes, I use their real names in a few shameless paraphrases and revisions of Cady Stanton and Smith and historical others, but the characters in Possessing Harriet are not the persons recalled, remembered, rendered and reflected in the historical record. For instance, Elizabeth Cady, not yet Cady Stanton in the play, is of course a well-known historical figure. And her cousin, abolitionist Garrett Smith, while lesser known, is not obscure in the history of abolition. Yes, I did my research, my kind of research, letting way lead on to way. But when the time came for me actually to write that most horrible hour, that most wondrous hour, I had to turn away from the voluminous shelves of writings about Garrett Smith and Elizabeth Cady, especially. I had to uninvent the invention history had made of them. I had to reimagine these two figures, Smith and Cady, 
as characters in my play. Though as real and present in 1839 as their white counterparts in the play, the two characters of color, titular Harriet, one quarter black and black to the bone Thomas Leonard are almost entirely products of my creative imagination. What I didn't know, couldn't, because there are no books about them, about the colored and black lives of Harriet Powell and Thomas Leonard allowed me access to something more valuable than facts, creative truth, my essential concern, and my goal as a playwright. Here's a safe bet. And the words I've given them by the traits with which I've invested them. The real Harriet Powell, Thomas Leonard, Garrett Smith, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton wouldn't recognize themselves in my play. I'm good with that. I intended to invent and write a drama, not edit and present a documentary. Not to exhibit, but to reveal. The characters around Harriet, especially Elizabeth and Garrett, are in possession of her. For Garrett, Harriet is an ideal exhibit A. For Elizabeth, Harriet is a beguiling problem set. Harriet tells us she doesn't have the words to discuss slavery, to discuss it as an argument but she absorbs her possessor allies argumentation and then turns them back on them as part of her fear-driven action to return to the only home, the only family she has known, even if it means returning to her master. That Harriet is on stage more than any other character and has the fewest lines is by design. It is an intentional structural white supremacy and a manifestation of the suppression of voice that comes of enslavement. That the Black characters are sometimes made marginalized witnesses to the white conversation about them is the point. It's the play's critique of white supremacy inside abolitionist thought, which in productions of the play so far has been made clear by directors and actors with nuanced understanding of how systems of subjugation work. In possessing Harriet, I mean to reveal truth, that mutable substance of fact, the truth truer than the facts. And though I am not a historian, possessing Harriet is a play about history, our shared history, that subjective truest story we tell ourselves about ourselves about our nation's ribbon past. And it's a play about how our past holds us all, every one of us in debt. I keep digging to fashion a creative work from what I encounter in my family history archive. I keep wiping my eyes of tears and dirt, but I keep digging. And then I try to find a place in my work for what my digging reveals about us all. I write about slavery directly and indirectly in my work because it is the genesis story of my family in this country. Since before this country was a country, we've been here on its soil my family's story is the American story. And for that story, and all the stories I have written and hopefully will write, I am indebted to Tolliver, my great great grandfather who made himself free, and to Tim and Lil who endured until free. For the inspiration of their lives, their courage, and their strength, strength I re-inherit by writing their names. And I have a family album of sorts I'd like to share with you. 
This is an image of the will I, I mentioned that sits on my mantle in my house. And in its line 14, where we encounter my Negro boy, Tim, this is from Captain Bennett, John Bennett. He was actually a British um, sympathizer. And so um, the house where Tim was, grew as a man, as an enslaved person, is still, it still stands in Westport because the British didn't burn it because Captain Bennett was a British loyalist. This is an image of Tolliver, my great great grandfather, standing on the steps of his first house that he owned as a free man. This is the picture that's in the, um, the room where I write. It's one of my favorite things in the world. This is Tolliver. And as I mentioned, he was born into slavery in Walkerton, Virginia, and uh, escaped north. This is Tolliver's son, Herbert. And this is my great great grandfather. And this um, portrait hangs in my mom's house. And I like how dapper he is. This is the house, this is Bennett House in Westport, Connecticut, where Tim was a domestic enslaved person. And there's a plaque that tells us about the house and when it was built in 1758, you see it down there. And when I went, I was taken by the tree that was standing there and I thought Tim knew that tree because that's an old tree. And it was something very, very startling to be sort of looking at a structure and vegetation and nature, trees that Tim might very well have known, certainly did know the house. This is a picture of the 26th Regiment of Colored Troops from New York, in which Tolliver is in there somewhere at Rikers Island. Um, I'm thinking about writing a, a play um, about Tolliver and his experience in uh, other troops from New York. This is a photo of the cast in character from my play, Possessing Harriet at Syracuse Stage. It has world premiere there, directed by Tassel Thompson in 2018. Um, it was a wonderful experience and um, in that table there, center, um, there is something of a surprise and I'll tell you about um, in a bit. And this is a clip from my play, Possessing Harriet at Syracuse Stage. I know you scared. Scared cause you never had a tomorrow like the tomorrow you gonna have tomorrow. But tomorrow you gonna breathe free. Freedom. This the last stop on your way there. Don't let your pretty shoes call the slave hunters to you. Can you feel it? I don't like the sun on me. Oh, this isn't the sun, this is the light. He is going to sell you! You think you know, all of you, you don't! Tell me, Elizabeth, what color will my freedom be? What color? I don't know all my letters. It will keep. Your mother got eyes to the future. She knew this day was gonna come. She sewed stars on your shoes. You walking on stars, Harriet. That ain't far from heaven.
This is a, um, a really interesting shot. There, um, the subsequent production of Possessing Harriet at Franklin Stage Company, 2019. And um, this work, this photograph um, was taken using um, the old sort of daguerreotype equipment. It was you know, taken in 2019, but made to look period. And one of the things that I really respond to in this photograph is um, that because of movement, the white characters in the play, um, Garrett Smith standing there behind Elizabeth Cady, are blurred. And it's the black characters who were in sharpest relief. And in the play, I intentionally do a lot of the opposite and about that idea of marginalization and blurring. Um, as I mentioned, um, Harriet is on stage the, the most and has the fewest lines. Um, um, I would argue that Thomas is on stage the most powerfully and probably has the second fewest lines. Um, so this, this um, photograph is a sort of a poetic, um, correction, if you will, um, of that of that intentional structure of mine. This is that table I was talking about from the production at Syracuse Stage, and that's in a picture of Tolliver. And I asked the director if I could put his picture in the drawer on the table through the run of the show for three weeks. And so for three weeks, Tolliver was in the drawer on set, sort of inspiriting the whole affair. Um, and it was very exciting to be thinking about his image up there when I was sort of watching the show for the 10th time, um, knowing he sort of had the best seat in the house. <laughs> My grandfather, Everett Holmes, was one of the first black mayors of New York State. Um, this highway sign um, sort of commemorates that. And uh, interestingly, he was the only black man who lived that town. Now, this is you know, 1974, only black man living in the town. He did not run for mayor, but he won by write-in. <laughs> um, and so we're very proud. And um, that sign along Route 20 went up um, uh, last summer, two summers ago. Um, and we're very proud of that history that from, you know, the grandson of um, an enslaved man, you know, becomes one of the first black mayors of New York State. And he's the only black man living in this small upstate town. That's Everett Holmes, a carpenter, my mother's father. And here are Everett's children. Um, the left is, my uncle Reggie, and then with, next to him is my aunt Debbie, and next to her is my aunt Leona, we call her Moni. And then next is my mom, Juanita. And then next to her is her sister, my aunt, Aunt Dodie. And my colleague, Brenna Merritt, made this composite, this sort of pairing when we were in rehearsal for Possessing Harriet, and that's me. And she put me next to my great-great-grandfather, Tolliver, and she said to me, look at the hands. I thought, oh, <laughs> that's where they come from. <laughs> um, and I have him on a t-shirt I'm wearing, so it's sort of... He was everywhere um, in that play and on that set. And this is really the legacy um, of Tolliver. This is my family, those are Tolliver's descendants. Um, as I said, we've been living and owning land in New York State. This is on our property, my mom's property, where I grew up in Frankfurt, New York. It's been 222 years that we have lived in New York State as free people. So, thank you for joining me. I'd like to thank Kyle Bass for that wonderful presentation. I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for joining us today.
If you'd like to learn more about possessing Harriet, I will be linking the Syracuse Stage website in the video description and it is also available at the link on your screen so that you can learn more about future possibilities of watching the play. Additionally, I ask that you fill out the survey linked in the video description as well as available on the link on your screen so that you can provide feedback about the specific presentation or the program in general. Your feedback will help us in the formulation of future presentations and programs like this one. Thank you and I hope we see you again tomorrow for our last presentation of the Black History in Upstate New York program, Heaven in Peterborough. Thank you.